Good evening everyone, time for another member update. Now this is the Silver Spot one hour chart um, with volume included and you can see that we started to rally from this long kind of saucer. We're starting to rally out of it, out of the saucer formation, but it's climbing slowly, nothing strong, nothing meaning we can't uh, turn around and go down some more. But that is uh, a fairly decent rally. If we come into the one minute chart, the volume's not really exceptional, um, just kind of normal, but you can see that the typical pattern that we always have is silver catches a bid on uh, some news or just a bunch of buyers at the same time and then um, then someone steps in and sells it down. So you can see that that was the exact pattern that we had there. Uh, we had that pattern before with Yellen, we had it here. Um, so it's it's being contained, It's being, the price is being controlled. And we'll look a little bit about that at uh, when we look at the Zero Hedge article. But I wanted to take you to this latest interview with Bix Weir. And the reason why I want to go to this is because he's talking here about the banker suicides or banker deaths. And we just had another one here We'll look at this after we listen to it with Jimmy Lee, the famed J.P. Morgan dealmaker. He dies at 62. And uh, but let's listen to Bix Weir here for a minute. Um, as, as far as the banks and bank resignations and suicides, bankers don't die when things are going well. They just don't. They stay in their position. They buy their boats and yachts and they, they just don't mysteriously die. It, it just doesn't happen. And if you go back in the last 15 years when we've had these kind of uh, concentrations of banker deaths and banker suicides and banker murders, they all happen right before and right during uh, chaotic things within the market. Uh, it starts, you know, going back to 2001, there was a bunch of banker suicides when the dot-com thing blew up and Enron, and then in 2008, there was a ton of them. And this year, there's there's even more. They're, they're coming once again. So you'll go through lulls and you'll go through high points in, in the suicide rate, and all it has to do with, uh, some of it has to do with them offing themselves because, you know, they know they're in trouble. Others have to do with, you know, uh, kind of illegal operations that, that they could be key witnesses and they're taken out. Uh, things like that happen when the banks are about to fall and during the fall. And if anybody reads my work, they're at the about to fall stage right now. Uh, the big one, obviously, is Deutsche Bank. What's going on there? And a couple weeks ago, they announced a surprise restructure of the bank. And Deutsche Bank's the largest bank in Germany. And, and the key to Deutsche Bank is they're the largest derivative holder in the world with over $70 trillion worth of, of toxic derivatives. I call them toxic because they're mostly toxic, I think, in the derivative book of, of Deutsche Bank because they tend to stick to the European Union the you know the credit default swaps on Greece are probably gigantic, and and uh, Deutsche Bank is the main holder of these large um, credit default swaps, and and then of course the major holder in America is going to be J.P. Morgan, so that makes it all the more. Now I don't know if I agree with Bix. He gave the alternative. He said that some of them off themselves because you know they know. Uh, they're going to be in big trouble. The, the second one is they're murdered because they're, we'll say they're suicided because they're potential witnesses in criminal investigations. And then the third alternative, which you know, I don't think anybody really gives too much, or I don't think anyone gives enough credence to, is that they're faking their own deaths. Uh, I thought that about... Um, the Enron guy. I've thought about that with a number of these that seems to indicate that there may be a disappearance. We, we've had some of them actually get caught trying to fake their own death and disappearance. I remember one uh, guy in New York who left his car on the bridge and then he threw his clothes down in the water and he tried to get a plane ticket out of the country. So that's, that's a possibility as well as well. But if we look at Jimmy Lee, this guy was right in the very heart of this stuff. Let's just read a little bit about what he was doing. 
Mr. Lee, who originally joined J.P. Morgan predecessor Chemical Bank, was a pioneer in syndicated lending and widespread practice today, which banks make big loans to companies that are divvied up among other lenders and credit investors to mitigate the risk. The development of the syndicate loan market has enabled companies and private equity firms to raise increasing sums of money for takeovers. Early on, he cultivated relationships with leaders of private equity firms like Stephen Schwartzman of Blackstone and Henry Kravis of KKR. He helped them make acquisitions using heavy dollops of junk bonds and loans. His franchise at J.P. Morgan and personal stature grew as successive mergers created what is now the nation's largest bank by assets. Mr. Lee eventually morphed into an advisor to chief executives like General Electric's Jeff Immelt on all manner of deals. He was instrumental in helping Rupert Murdoch's News Corp acquire the Wall Street Journal in 2007 and played a leading role in the relisting in 2010 of General Motors and the $25 billion leveraged buyout of Dell. And it continues. This is amazing. In recent years, he developed a penchant for working with technology companies like Facebook. He advised Chinese e-commerce company Alibaba on its historic initial public offering. Alibaba prepared to go public in what would be the biggest IPO at $25 billion. Mr. Lee frequently traveled to China to secure J.P. Morgan's leading role in the offering. At J.P. Morgan's annual CEO dinner in late 2013, known internally as Jimmy's Dinner, it was clear he had made some progress. Founder Jack Ma was sitting next to him. Ultimately, the bank was tapped, uh, one of six was tapped to lead the deal, but Mr. Lee still found ways to stand out. Mr. Lee was the face of an ill-fated planned Twitter question and answer quest, uh, session. Oh, I thought that was about uh, Twitter, their involvement with Twitter. Um, but they were involved with them all. He was involved with just about every important deal. And he dies mysteriously at age 62. So uh, Bix says in the end part of the interview, he says you've got about 90 days to get all of your money out of the system. Take that for what it's worth, but there's a lot of people seeing the same sort of things going on. I wanted to go to a story here on Zero Hedge about this mysterious massive seller who flash crashed gold. This is very interesting because what this reveals about how the regulators are involved in this thing. So let's read a little bit of this story. Back in late 2013, early 2014, the gold and silver market was stunned by a series of massive, unprecedented stop or velocity logic sales, which sent the price of the precious metals crashing so furiously that they halted the entire gold futures market anywhere between 10 and 20 seconds. Some examples were September 12, 2013, October 11, 2013, and January 6, 2014. Some said this was nothing but a fat finger, but we together with Nanex showed that this was clearly a premeditated attempt to reprice gold lower, facilitated by the oldest trick in the book, HFT book, quote stuffing. As a reminder, only recently did regulators finally realize just how manipulated the gold market is when in early May, after a zero hedge post explicitly showed just how someone was spoofing gold, both the CME and the CFTC cracked down on the manipulator. However, the moves that had seen regulatory intervention were paltry and largely irrelevant in the grand scheme of gold price discovery until today. In a notice of disciplinary action, COMEX, uh, the CME charged Myris Futures, which one year ago was bought by Ninja Trader with disruptive and rapid price movements in the February 2014 gold futures market, which prompted the above mentioned Velocity Logic event, which halted the market for 10 seconds. And so here's the allegation. Now, what one interesting thing about this is that not only did gold go down at the same time with silver, but Bitcoin actually went down at the same time, which is very interesting. And uh, I wanted to jump over to the Bitcoin chart here real quick because that's starting to take off. And it's, it's analogous to this pattern that we had here. You can see the original run-up in Bitcoin where it ran to almost $350, I think it was. 
and then it crashed back down to 50 bucks or something like that. You can see a fairly long consolidation period. It took it quite a while for it to recover. And then uh, the beginning of the recovery was this breakout here. And then finally the ramp and rally that happened. Now you can see that it's, it's just starting to do something like that. Um, it spiked up to, you know, 260, but it's been going sideways for quite some time. So that's a fairly decent move. Now, much more significant move is in Litecoin. Of course, this is Litecoin in U.S. dollars. This is the this is the coin that I prefer because most of my coins that I trade on the alt exchanges are denominated in Litecoin. Some are denominated in Bitcoin, but most of them are denominated in Litecoin. And you can see the size of this move. Litecoin since May now, or even since really just a few days ago, has nearly doubled in price. So that, that is a phenomenal move. And it might be an indication that these markets are finally coming back. You have to remember with Bitcoin, and that's why I wanted to talk about that in relation to this article, that we were reading, you have to remember that Bitcoin, you can't short it. There's no way to short it because, you, I mean, you could borrow someone's Bitcoins and sell them on the market if they let you. But to sell down Bitcoin, it takes real Bitcoin. That's not true with silver and gold. You can sell silver that you don't have. You can sell paper silver. The vast majority of the market for silver and gold is 99% is paper. And so... That's different with Bitcoin. So just how that happened, maybe it was just because there was some panic at the same time. But Bitcoin is definitely different than those other assets because it cannot be shorted. Now, they may find some way to do that at some point and have a fund like that or something like that. But really, it's very, very difficult to do and there aren't that many derivatives based on it. So I personally think with Jimmy Lee... I think that probably it was a witness sort of deal. And the thing is, is that we never, we never really get the testimony. We, we have these crashes and we have these investigations for whatever they're worth. And they look into things a little bit, but no one's really ever punished. They never really find the culprits that caused it. And uh, so that's kind of strange. Um, that you'd see so many banker deaths, but it could be somebody covering up a trail. It's just it's just hard to know for sure. So we're looking at a potential window of 90 days, according to Bix, where I think that's a decent guess. Again, that puts us right in that September time frame. And uh, I wanted to jump over to the GOAT series here. Now, I thought when I, I, I just got my GOATs in that I bought, but I thought when I bought these from Jam Bullion, and uh, then I think there were only about 100 left and someone snapped those up, uh, I found the other ones here on Provident, and I thought that when they sold out, they would be out. But they're not. They have a 1,000. They've got a 1,000 back. So um, I don't know if they were holding them off the market or they ordered them. Or Perth Mint is still shipping. I don't know those details. But you can see when we look at the price, the one ounce is still 26, 21. Now that's come down a bit. It's 28 on the other sites. But if you think about it, you're getting two coins for 24, 60, and you're getting one coin for 26. The half ounce is still by far the better deal. This, the two ounce just on straight silver costs is going to be the best deal of all because that's going to be 22 bucks an ounce. But the two ounce coins, in my opinion, don't have a, quite as much appreciation potential as the half ounce do, just because you have you have more coins for one thing. You have four times the number of coins. So I'm still liking this. It's good to see that they got some more in. We'll see how long this thousand lasts and if they get more in after that. So we're doing a little bit of a rally, but nothing serious. And it's just still time to keep stacking as that window gets closer and closer before the system shuts down. And we'll talk to you next time.